follow along as we complete the east region of the United States Trans-American Trail over the course of four years. Our travels jump around a little bit in this video, but we'll be going in the order that it should be done. From the North Carolina coastline, with the West Virginia Spur, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Arkansas. We stop at a ton of iconic Trans-American Trail locations, along with some of the most scenic views along the trail. Over the four years of completing these sections, we are joined with a bunch of different passengers and friends following along. Along with putting a ton of mileage on our vehicles, we also put our gear to the test. So hang out, watch all the miles fly by, the camp spots, water crossings, and small diners we find along the way. Eventually we want to do coast to coast. So the first move was to finish off the east coast by going from West Virginia, heading east, and using the Atlantic Spur section to connect all the way down to Nags Head Island. On this section, we're bringing along Nathan Straub, one of our good buddies who owns the company Decisive Action. What are your expectations for the trip? Um, I just want to see some beautiful trails and scenery, uh, being out in nature. Uh, never done winter camping before, so that should be pretty interesting. Test out all the cold weather gear. Um, but yeah, just along for the ride and having some fun. So don't really know what to expect along for the ride with Jeremiah and trusting his overlanding expertise. Oh God. We're also really wanting to try out this gas bag from Giant Loop and see how it performs. This is the two gallon. They also make up to a five gallon, which the day we left arrived in the mail. But so far it's easy to fill and the gas cap stays on pretty tight. We are starting the Trans America Trail in Ripley, West Virginia. Two things about this one is I like doing the Trans America Trail during the winter time because you can see further, but the issues with that is there are a lot of seasonal trail closers, hopefully not this time. Um, and the other thing is I am pulling a trailer now with the Gladiator and I haven't done that on snow yet, so it, hopefully there, we won't find any snow in the uh, Forestry Trail passes. So here we go. Right at South Ripley, we hit coarse gravel, so it was time to air down for the rest of the trip. Most of the way across West Virginia isn't really exciting. It's a mix between good and bad pavement, gravel, unmaintained county roads, but there's nothing too extensive about this. The scenery pretty much repeats itself. Gravel, paved, small town, paved, gravel, so on and so on. about 3.30 until we really started getting towards the mountains on the eastern side of West Virginia. When we hit the Williams River Valley, that's when the trip changed. We will come back to the specific section of this trail because of all the amazing camp spots that line it that are closed due to the season. It was at about this time that Nathan and I realized we only had passed about six vehicles the whole day and we didn't see a single soul in this whole area.
this is also the area where we started hitting snow and ice due to elevation. We finally found an open campground at the north part of the river, so we went into setup mode. Straub would be camping underneath the awning in his ground tent, and he got to use our new Zarge's case as his equipment footlocker. That evening, we enjoyed some of our favorite country beers, had a mountain house meal, and went to bed pretty early. Much like we thought, the seasonal closures haven't happened so far on the trails, just on the campgrounds. We found the last remaining open campground that had no closed signs and all still had uh, envelopes to pay for the camp spots. Now we are heading on for day two. Heading east over the Appalachian Mountains from here is where we hit all of the mountain passes. Immediately there was snow and thick ice where it had been packed down from the few vehicles that had passed through this area recently. After a slow and puckering crossing of that first mountain, we headed down the other side to head to my first drop pin for a diner that I wanted to try out. If you get a chance, stop by Dory's Restaurant and Lounge in Marlington, West Virginia. Their homemade country fried steak and biscuits were some of the best I've ever had. Just on the other side of Marlington would be the tallest in elevation and most ice covered mountain pass of the trip. Also the sketchiest because a lot of the switchbacks had pure ice on the corners. Other than a few gaps, the mountaintop was complete cloud cover. But soon realized all the way into Virginia, it would be like this. The valleys were equally as beautiful as the mountaintops. You would skirt 10-15 miles down a valley, then weave up and over the next mountain pass. So we just turned on to the Atlantic Spur section of the trans -America Trail. We finished the West Virginia trans -America Trail in about a day and a half. It's 1.55, we started at 8.30 a.m. this morning. Um, already the mountains are looking different, not as big. We have, I think, three small mountain crossings and then we'll start heading southeast to Nagset Island. Time to give the gas bag a go. We first tried to use it without the spout. That didn't go so well. But slap on that spout, it's super easy to use. Since while emptying, the bag just collapses on itself, it doesn't need a ventilation port, and it empties quick. Put the cap back on, roll it up, and just strap it to the bed. For the rest of this day, we had decent weather, intermittent sun, and awesome trails.
second night's camp spot was easy to find. We pulled just a short distance of a forestry trail and set camp. We have a ton of miles just to get to the coast, so day three started early. And it started with some delicious bougie coffee. Nothing like a fancy pour over coffee to start your morning. On the way over the last pass, we had just a little bit of snow before we hit the Virginia foothills. We even got to see a backwoods correctional facility. From the mountains all the way to the coast, it's pretty boring and redundant back roads. Even the website says the second half is worth the ride, just hang in there. The back roads and countryside are beautiful, and the rest is all pavement, but that's the price you pay for living in a densely populated area near the coast. But when you start hitting all the bridges that connect all the chain islands all the way out to the coast, it is gorgeous. We got there a day and a half after leaving the Virginia mountains. This is one part of the trail that I wish was in the summertime. It was beautiful, but extremely windy and cold. We made it down here in four days. It was an awesome trip, lots of back roads, and we're down at Nags Head Island. It's time to knock out another section of the Trans-American Trail. This time, we're heading to Virginia. We left Lexington around 4 a.m., hit Damascus, Virginia around 9.30 a.m. Riding with me on this trip is Chris, a.k.a. El Jefe, and we're meeting up with Yolanda, Bryce, and Axel, some friends who bought an X-Venture trailer at Expo East. So what are your expectations for this trip? I'm gonna eat more pork rinds, drink more coffee, see some cool have a nap in the woods probably piss in the woods once or twice maybe get drunk on some country boy beer all right let's be honest i'm gonna get drunk on some country boy beer the stockholms pulled in around 10 gassed up and did a little work we brought them a second battery from x venture and got them hooked up with some zamp solar panels and again, traveling with newer people, having rocky talkies saved the day. You got communication? No, I do not have any comms. The human torch was denied a bank loan. But the Falcon crashed. And we've started the trail. On the other side of Damascus, there was just a short mountain climb to the first turnoff. I absolutely love the Appalachian Mountains. We did the North Carolina section of the Trans-American Trail in the middle of summer, and I was curious to see what the difference would be between riding in the Appalachian Mountains in the winter to summer when there's full leaf cover. It was immediately evident that a good brake controller on this trip would be key. Being able to switch our Toe Pro Elite to off-road mode, priceless. Didn't take long till we both had to stop and air down the tires. It's a little 60. High. Bryce and Yolanda are two of the nicest people we've ever met. They definitely make this trip a lot more fun. It's got a lot of bulge. It's good bulge. Sidewalls punching out just right. Traveling with animals adds a whole new dynamic to overlanding. Baby couldn't join us on this one, but Axel was having a blast running along the trail with us. A little bit down the trail, we heard of all too familiar sound, just like the previous trip to the Frog Loop. 
the channel on the rhino rack had blown out again. Yeah. So I had a... Blown out the channel here and here so far. After a quick repair, we hung out for a little bit and let the dog stretch his legs. Our lunch spot picked out for the day was Painted Pink Brewing in Tazewell, Virginia. This place was awesome, hitting on all cylinders. We brought them in some Country Boy Brewing, ordered from their huge menu. They even had alcoholic sodas on tap. They were even gracious enough to throw up some of our stickers. Opinion on Painted Peak Brewery? Rocking. Good steak. Uh, actually, huge menu for a, for a brewery. Eight, nine, ten fermenters. Ton of beer. Good people. Everybody's really friendly, and you can play pool and eat brewery. At this point of our trip, this is what we'll call inadequate lighting. When we got back to Kentucky, we ordered Baja Design Squadron Pro Lights. Of course, it being winter, all of the campgrounds were closed, so we camped right outside the gates of White Cedar Horse Campground. Camp went up in about 20 minutes, so we whipped out the propane fire pit and drank some good old reliable shotgun wedding. <sighs> Something to keep vigilant about is camp safety. Sleep was a little rough with the raccoon hunters running up and down the road all night long. Especially when they were looking for their dogs, they tried walking through our camp at 2 a.m. It was a bit hard getting back to sleep after that commotion. Just something to think about when you're planning your next trip. We took our time getting camp packed up and got back on the road, only to be stopped five minutes in. We just ran into a recurrent problem with traveling uh, in the winter, which is road closures. So always check with the park services uh, before you get onto the roads and make sure that your path is open and they haven't gone through some seasonal closures. We're now having to backtrack a little bit in order to, to do a workaround. So just something to note. Quite a bit of the Trans-American Trail are back roads, county roads, and unapproved roads. Doesn't make it any less fun. Those parts of the country are usually where you find little gems. The Virginia section of the Trans-American Trail crosses over the Appalachian Trail quite a bit. When we crossed it, we got out, walked a few feet, so technically we hiked a portion of the Appalachian Trail. What are you doing, Chris? Walking the Appalachian Trail right. with my coffee. And another seasonal closure. This one was pretty disappointing. It was a 15 mile stretch that we had to parallel on county roads. The county roads were still beautiful, but from them you could see how awesome that trail would be covered in clouds. This would be one of three sections we couldn't do due to time of year. Next stop was Penny's Diner. These are the type places I love to find when out traveling. With a Waffle House type menu, this hit the spot. A short distance out of Lowmore, Virginia, we stopped for a little bit to see some mountain streams and put the drone up for the first time since the weather had been rainy, extremely windy, or just low visibility or in a state park. I 
just like to note, it's our opinion that on these length of trips, where you're just trying to cover miles, two to three vehicles is the perfect amount to keep a pace that everyone can settle on. It was really great to travel with two X-Venture trailers with two different vehicles to see how they handled. For the next five hours after lunch, we busted tail to get to our last stop before they closed for the night. Once again, insufficient lighting made for slower going. I thought that LED headlights and fog lights would do the trick. I was wrong. Our last destination stop for the trip was Big Fish Cider Company in Monterey, Virginia. We made it 45 minutes to close. This place is awesome. It's in a small town, they have award-winning ciders, and it even came complete with a salty bartender. We spent our remaining 30 minutes while they were open talking about the day and the things we saw. The Virginia section stays in Appalachia Mountains. I recommend it to anybody. We parted ways from Bryce, Yolanda, and Axel, pointed the Jeep west, and drove all night through the rain straight back to Kentucky. It is 3.30 a.m. and we're leaving for North Carolina on the Trans-America Trail. If you don't hear from me in two days, call the police. We're headed from Lexington, Kentucky to Damascus, Virginia, where we'll get on the North Carolina section of the Trans-America Trail after we meet up with our buddy Rob, who's gonna be riding it on his Enduro bike. Where are we? Wise County, Virginia. Just now leaving Damascus, Virginia, about heading south to to Asheville area. We're going on an adventure. <laughs> so far, we're 62 miles in and making good time. We have the first casualty of the trip. You all right? Yeah. What just happened, Brett? I just growled. I lost it. It was great, though. When you ride right along the razor's edge, you're bound to get burned. Most definitely. Feast at the helm.
Bernie Mac in there, fancy feet. Bacon, eggs, cheesy eggs, sausage, hash browns. Breakfast of champions. Ready to go day two, another 240 miles to go. I'm still filling. <laughs> <laughs> well, old Rob is filling his gas tank. Yes, still. We'll do a little recap of what we did yesterday. We left Lexington at 3.30 in the morning, got to Damascus, Virginia about 9 a.m. We did quite a few miles on a 275. Road. 256 of the trail. Uh, we had to skip two sections. The section at Martin's Mountain was closed due to a washout. That was a 10 mile section. And then the section at Forest Road 63 was closed. We don't know why. That was a 26 mile section. Packed up, ready to go. And we're going to possibly do the, the second half. Just get it all done in two days. Sore ass about that, right? Oh, most definitely. <laughs> Sore ass, yes. <laughs> Teleco Plains. We did 527.8 miles of the Transamerica Trail starting from Damascus, uh, Virginia, uh, all the way down the North Carolina section and ended up here in Teleco Plains. Well, we only had a bypass, what, 37 miles? Yeah, well, one good section, uh, about 20 miles. Uh, but I mean, other than that, I know River Road was one of them, which is a good, hey, there we go. They're celebrating our completion.
Nathan and I are in Teleco Plains where I finished up the first section of Trans American Trail I ever did in North Carolina, from North Carolina down to here. As per usual, it doesn't take long to get right onto the trail. It's the beginning of spring and it looks like it's going to be perfect weather for the whole trip. One thing I couldn't wait to try out was our new Gladiator 2.5 inch premium lift from Clayton Offroad in combination with our Falcon 3.3 adjustable shocks. Didn't really know what to expect from this part of the trail, but it didn't take long to see what we're going to be getting into. The Tennessee Mountain has some of the most beautiful mountain streams you've ever seen. There had been torrential rains the week before, so we didn't know what we were gonna get into when it comes to the water crossings. Turns out, we had just enough clearance to make it through these sections safely while running solo. If this first section was a gauge on what the rest of the trail is gonna be, this is gonna be an awesome trip. Previous week's storms have also taken their toll on the deadfall. This little 12 volt DeWalt chainsaw is worth his weight in gold. We couldn't be happier that all the forest road gates so far have been open. If you're looking for a good three to four day trip and you live in the Tennessee area, I recommend this section above all others we've done so far. The little pieces of Americana you come across on this trail are worth the trip alone. You'll also hear us say in other videos, we love traveling during the winter time or when there's no leaves or little leaves on the trees because the views are unbeatable. There's nothing technically too hard about this trail, but it's still a lot of fun. The Tennessee section of the trans American Trail actually travels through four states. It dips down into Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. The first little dip down into Georgia is at Copper Hill, Tennessee, where we stopped at the Copper Hill Brewery and had a quick beverage. Then a Cuban sandwich before we hit the road again. Just outside Copper Hill, we hit our first closed section of trail, right at the beginning of the Big Frog Loop Mountain area. But luckily, the year before, we had already done that whole loop, so we weren't missing any sections of the main trail. We hope this section reopens soon for anybody trying it, because it is something to see. We picked the trail back up 20 miles northwest around Parksville Lake. From the Virginia section all the way through Tennessee, it always amazes me how fast you can change elevation. In this area, we had found a few decent camp spots, but they were very exposed and it was extremely windy at the higher elevations. I know there are beautiful views from out west, 
but you still can't beat the ones in Appalachia. Make sure you put a waypoint on your maps for Barnes Creek Falls. It was getting late and all of our planned camp spots were on the closed section, so we pushed on for another four to four and a half hours just to find a decent forestry camp spot. Between Nathan and I, camp setup went very quick. We were a third of the day past where we had planned camping, so the next morning we weren't in a huge rush. I slept great, but apparently Nathan not so much. Was it a rough night of sleep? <laughs> it was a little rough. There were bears everywhere. Coming into the tents, I fought them off. Jeremiah didn't do a damn thing. I had to do it all myself. My hands are bloody. I wiped them up clean so you can't see it now. Plus they're under my leg. But we made it. Day one, in the boots. Day two. It was about an hour and a half drive to get to Maddie's on Main for some really good country breakfast. For the first day and a half, we had been heading southwest. Now that we're at the bottom of the state, it's time to head west. There was only one last mountainous area to cross through, and that's the Crawford Pigeon Mountain WMA. I'm going to come back to this area just to spend some time in camp. 20 miles down a forestry road coming down the back side of the mountain range, we came across something you just don't see every day. The Google had done him wrong. This poor guy had made it past six other switchbacks before getting stuck on this one. We barely made it past. He didn't want help. He was waiting on a wrecker that probably would never come. From this area forward, it looks a lot like Kentucky. We cross over from Georgia to Tennessee, to Alabama, back into Tennessee, and through endless fields of yellow flowers. There aren't really any national forest sections through the center of Tennessee, so we ended up finding a campground, the Sycamore Campground and Taco Shack, the same one the Mountain State Overland guys camped at. They weren't open because they had experienced massive flooding, but they still let us camp on the highest ground in the area. Anybody doing the Trans American Trail, stop here. These guys went above and beyond to make us feel at home. After a good night's sleep, it was got your six coffee time. We knew going into this morning, the first thing would be a pretty wide water crossing. Due to all the flooding, we didn't know if we could do it. After throwing up the drone, we saw that it was easily passable and continued on our merry way. The trails on the west side of the state are a mix of forestry roads, roads that follow creeks, roads through creeks, where the roads were creeks, but all around beautiful and relaxing. We stopped in the small town of Waterloo at the Waterloo Market for a quick lunch and some gas before heading for the last section of the trail. There was only about 60 miles left and those last 60 miles were some of the nicest maintained gravel roads through backcountry and logging areas. So we are near the end and I was really looking forward to this part of the trail. It crosses over a bunch of long stretches of water that have paved road under the water. 
and it is majorly flooded. So we're gonna pick up here on our next section heading out west and continue on then. It had been a full month since we tried last time. There's an easy bypass of this section. I just didn't want to take it and we're extremely relieved to see that it was open. So we did a quick air down and got on our way. These are the smoothest gravel roads that I've ever been on. This area was the perfect way to start a new section of the trail. It also allowed us to tune in the suspension to allow for the weight of the new Putco bed rack. I wish I could have seen this area full of crops. After crossing the Pickwick Dam on the Tennessee River, it's just a short drive to start Mississippi. Officially in Mississippi. I could already tell I was going to make some miles on this trip every day just because of the roads. They were clay and gravel roads and very smooth. quick stop for lunch at High on the Hog Barbecue. Just like every other state that we've done, the trail usually consists of road, gravel, dirt, gravel, road, and repeating. But at least on this section, we can average around 35 to 45 miles per hour in these back roads, just because of how good the roads are. After the Tennessee section, I'd heard just a little bit of chatter coming from the trailer. Turns out we had broken something pretty crucial. So I looked up fabricators on Google Maps, found one 20 miles away, gave them a call and they said, come on down. The bracket that Xventry uses to connect the side post to the bottom of the roof rack had sheared. As soon as I showed up, the guys at Mississippi Metal Magic jumped into action. I didn't want anything pretty, just enough to get me home. I can't tell you how skilled and professional these guys were and how fast they got this done. Thanks Mississippi Metal Magic for getting us back on the road in under 30 minutes. Being one of the early model trailers, they have since fixed this issue and made it out of steel. It's also worth mentioning this trailer has been to the tip of South America on the Pan American Highway, across Canada, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, hundreds of weekend warrior trips, and half the Trans American Trail. And this is the first hardware failure that I've seen. All day I've been extremely happy at the pace that I've been able to maintain. There are some very slow sections that you have to take your time on, especially if this area has lots of rain. It is clay and mud and it sticks to everything. The tow pro came in very handy in this section, keeping me straight in line going down slick trails, using the trailer almost as an anchor. Oh, and thank you logging truck for the nice chip in the windshield. Mississippi isn't a long section, and one day we did about three-fourths of the trail, finding our first camp spot in Holly Springs National Forest. <laughs>
this happens to be one of our top camp spots of the year so far. It was a 15 hour day of driving, so being able to find campsite gold and relax was everything. Going to bed early was not a problem with the sound of a million frogs serenading us to sleep. After a quick camp breakdown, I got the drone up to check out the area. It definitely pays to spend a lot of time on maps before you go somewhere and try to pick out a few camp spots, at least have one or two backups. Luckily I didn't need one and this place was perfect. extremely long drive day today and after Holly Springs National Forest there are no more national forests in this state. After a few hours of driving country roads we finally hit the plains areas. This is the furthest west that I have driven so far so seeing roads go on forever straight make a turn and then straight on again was a unique experience. On the east coast we don't have straight roads this long. Mississippi reaffirmed why I love overlanding. Every turn brings something different. Interactions with the local culture, the ever-changing geography, and the friendships we make along the way. This section ends crossing the Mississippi into Arkansas. I did not expect much out of Mississippi being a shorter section, but I was pleasantly surprised. We pick up where we left off crossing the Mississippi into Arkansas, starting in the city of West Helena. Joining us on this trip is our buddy RJ. I'm sure West Helena has some great spots in it, but from what we saw, it looked abandoned with a lot of burnt down buildings. Just north of West Helena is St. Francis National Forest. We found our camp on the Porter Bayou in the cypress groves and the knees coming out of the ground were amazing. Some of these trunks were 10 feet across. Of course we had to crack one before setting up camp. Excited to find this spot, camp went up pretty quickly. What are your expectations for this trip? Well, it's to end up in the middle of nowhere. The first night, we're already sitting in the middle of a cypress grove and drinking some good beer. So, yeah, it's going great so far. We went to bed early due to how long our following day was going to be. Good morning, camp. We made it through a night. The first morning of breaking down camp with a new travel partner always goes a little bit slower, but we set into a pretty good groove immediately. We got up at 6 a.m. to get the day started, but we're not going anywhere without coffee. We use Got Your Six Coffee, a Jet Royal, and a Brew Trek coffee press, because we have found that's the fastest way to do it. We have tried many other ways, but this is the most convenient and easiest to clean up. It's also nice finding out that RJ is a morning person too. One quick drone flight before we go to check out the area. While buzzing around, we discovered a small group of river otters. With our gullets full of coffee, we skipped breakfast and got right to the trail west of Helena, and it turns flat almost immediately. I 
I was pleasantly surprised that the roads were so well maintained, even though most of them were gravel or hard pack, we were able to maintain around 45 miles per hour. Something special about the Transamerica Trail is along the way there are tons of little unique stops that people put up. At this stop they have a sign-in book and you can check out all the awesome stickers and all the other registered people that have signed in. So before we moved on, we made our mark as well. Even though some of the roads are a little bit sloppy, we are loving how fast we are able to go. This is on a duck and geese migration route from Canada, and they were there by the thousands. The first day's roads are pretty consistent. There are no national forests in this area, so it's all backcountry byways, gravel roads, pavement, gravel roads, rinse and repeat. Some of these sections before you hit the Ozark Mountains are on long, straight 10-mile stretches. And at the end of this stretch was the only closed road that we encountered that day. And it was due to construction, not seasonal trail closures. About 20 miles from the Ozark National Forest, we stopped in Quitman to fill up two of our five-gallon gas bags and to get lunch. We stopped at the doghouse for some country cooking and it did not disappoint. Up to this point, the landscape hadn't changed very much. But in a five mile stretch, it changed from flat to the Ozark foothills and it felt like some backcountry Kentucky. As soon as you cross over into the Ozark National Forest, you start heading up. It always pays to scout ahead to find your camp spots in advance and at least have one or two backups. We had scouted a trail about a quarter mile off the main path. We like to use our drone as an aerial scout to see if the pre-planned paths will actually work out. By doing a few hours of pre-trail planning, we were able to find this little gym. Most of the time this is the case, spend a few extra hours and find the best camp spots we have ever found. The trail that I had chosen turned out to be a goat trail, but a little pinstripes never hurt anybody. Finding a level spot proved to be difficult, but with some max tracks we made it work. We had heard that the Ozarks have amazing water features and trail systems. While we had the drone up, I found a better route to get out the next day. I was also able to test out a new piece of gear from Sea Sucker, which is a very slim trash can mounted with vacuum mounts. Nice piece of gear that doesn't take up a ton of space. After a 
few beverages, I convinced RJ that it might be time for him to take his first polar plunge. Plus, that boy needed a bath. Especially since our guests would be arriving soon. We also invited Chad from Ozark Overland to join us on this trip. The man is an overland gear machine. He had his camp set up in under 10 minutes and was cooking an amazing spaghetti dinner. We had checked our Gaia weather app a few times and it only said 10% chance of severe rain. Little did we know, 10 miles to the south of us, the tornadoes that ripped through Mayfield, Kentucky and a lot of Arkansas passed only 10 miles below us. The lightning storms were insanity. And for about five minutes, the tail of the storm hit us with really heavy rain. After that nerve-wracking ordeal, it was time for a few drinks. Did I mention that Chad had everything? Even this little device that made round ice cubes for bourbon drinks. The rest of the evening was extremely peaceful next to the water and the fire. We see here two overlanders in their natural habitat saving leftovers, the spoils of the day, into a Ziploc bag to go into their bougie 12 volt refrigerators. We made rise and shine around 8 o'clock. We didn't have very far to go today, just lots to see. The trail that I had previously scouted the day before turned out to be nicer and wider. We switched our shocks to soft and aired down to 20 PSI. Surprisingly, we only saw a little bit of damage from the storm the night before. This area has a mixture of mountains resembling Tennessee and North Carolina, without the higher elevation changes. Our first stop was Long Pool Recreation Area. I'll be coming back to this area to fly fish and just hang out in the summer when I can actually get in the water. Another must stop overlook is Pilot Knob. You can miss it if you blink, so make sure to mark it on your maps and take the steep climb to the top of the bluff.
Another little small detour is to go to Union School. It's only about a quarter mile off the main trail and you get to do two awesome water crossings. The Union Schoolhouse was established a little bit before 1886 and it served as a church, community center, and a school. During its heyday, it had two teachers. Kind of a cool piece of history. I would say on all of our Trans-American Trail, we've not stopped at a better diner. The Oark General Store in Oark, Arkansas. The Oark General Store, listed in the Arkansas Register of Historic Places, was opened in 1890 in response to demand for the grocery and supplies in this isolated community. We recognized some pretty famous travelers, had been through and left a sticker on the front. Make sure when you go in, order a burger and a piece of their famous pie. From the Oric General Store is a short drive to Burge Adventure Center. This is where we'll be staying for the night. It cost us 10 bucks a head and the bathroom facilities were heated. We were one of two camping visitors to this place, and we got a prime spot overlooking the Mulberry River. Cheers, gentlemen. Cheers. We really don't understand where Chad fits all of his gear, this guy has an oven that he cooks pizza in. Not that we were mad about it. I was dumb and didn't bring enough coffee with us, but luckily I had a Got Your Six Coffees IFAC, individual first aid coffee kits, AKA chocolate covered espresso beans. Soon after leaving the campground, we hit our second and last road closure. Luckily, it was only a two mile difference for the change and we got to stop at Shores Lake, which I don't know why this isn't on the main route to begin with. Another quarter mile detour off the trail is White Rock Mountain with unbeatable views. Also at the top of this mountain is a little general store so I could load up on kitschy knickknacks and coffee. It even comes with a salty cashier. I've heard of a few occasions where locals will put up dead-end signs or road close signs because they don't like the traffic coming through the areas. So when we saw this, we got a little worried. But soon found out that that dead-end sign was because halfway through this section, you needed four-wheel drive and high clearance just to get through.
next few hours, it was pretty standard forestry roads, dirt, gravel, dirt, gravel. I love the Americana Diner experience. It's where the die-hard locals hang out, and it's where we find the most hospitality. So when we pulled up and there was a horse at the exterior order window, we knew we were going to enjoy it. What's his name? Streak. What up, Streak? They were also pretty heavy on supporting first responders. And as expected, the food was legit. Even after, Chad dipped a deep fried pickle in my milkshake. Ya nasty. After refueling, we went ahead and aired up with one of 500 pieces of gear that Chad brought, of course, because we only had six more miles of this section. At this point, we're out of the Ozarks and it starts to flatten back out. That gravel turning to dirt marks the Oklahoma state line. We'll see you next time when we hit Oklahoma going west.